Part 2. The Correlation of the Facts of Psychology and Physiology in Connection with Mental Healing. Chapter 1. Introductory. Considered from a purely psychological standpoint, the working hypothesis for mental healing which is set forth in Part 1 of this book seems to be complete and valid. That is to say, it fully and completely explains all the facts of purely mental healing that have yet been brought to light through the indefinite number of systems that are now in vogue or of which history informs us. Much remains to be done, however, before mental medicine can be said to rest upon a purely scientific basis. Other sciences remain to be explored, namely, physiology and histology, or physiological psychology, before an adequate knowledge of the subject can be approximated. 4. Whilst the force or energy employed in mental healing may be purely psychological, that energy is expended upon a physiological structure. This presupposes a nexus between the two. And although this nexus may be intangible and hence incapable of being dragged to light by means of the surgeon's forceps, we may hope to find the machinery in the anatomical or histological structure of man, through which the psychological energy operates in the production of therapeutic results. If, then, we find the mechanism especially e-adapted to its supposed uses, a great point will be gained, for we shall have a right to infer that it is so employed. In other words, the correlation of the facts of psychology with those of physiology with reference to the problem of mental healing will afford conclusive evidence as to the correctness of our fundamental psychological hypothesis. Moreover, as the discovery of a new truth invariably leads to a solution of old problems, it is hoped that this will constitute no exception to the rule. I hope, therefore, to be able, first, to point out the physiological machinery through which the subjective mind operates to produce therapeutic results. In this there will be nothing new to science except my conclusions, for I shall accept, at their full value, all the facts which modern science has discovered in reference to the histological structure of sentient beings. Facts which no scientist pretends to doubt or deny. Facts which lie at the basis of all accepted modern physiological science. To this end, I shall draw largely upon the accepted facts of histology, which is the branch of biology that treats of the structure of the tissues of organized bodies, in short, microscopic anatomy. The salient histological fact upon which I shall dwell is that all organic tissue is made up of microscopic cells, each one of which is a living, intelligent entity. This includes the bones, hair, and nails as well as the muscles and nerves, and all other portions of the organic structure. I shall also accept the latest and most universally accepted, because the most obviously true, theory of disease, namely, that a disease of the body is a disease of the cells of the body. This is, indeed, a corollary of the demonstrable fact that all organic tissue is composed of cells. It follows that the cure of disease consists in restoring the diseased cells to normal health and activity, metabolism. How to affect that object, however, is where doctors disagree. Thus far my statements will not be disputed by any living scientist, or by modern doctors of medicine who keep pace with the discoveries of medical research. But when I attempt to show that the cellular structure of the physical man is the basic fact of mental healing, I shall probably run counter to some very old and very pronounced prejudices. Nevertheless, I shall attempt to show that these intelligent entities, which we call cells, and of which the whole body is composed, are obviously amenable to control by mental impulses from the central intelligence which controls the functions of the body, and that they, in fact, constitute the machinery by and through which the mind controls the body in health and disease. Nor shall I be entirely unsupported in this view for I shall be able to quote the highest materialistic authority admitting the existence of a central intelligence in man which controls the functions of each individual cell of which the whole body is composed. In fact, no intelligent person denies the existence and potency of this central power and intelligence which keeps the machinery of organic life in operation. It has been variously designated as the vital principle, the principle of life, the soul, the communal soul, the unconscious mind, the subconscious mind, the subliminal consciousness, the subjective mind, etc., the designation being governed by the point of view from which the subject is treated. But no one, be he materialist or spiritualist, denies its existence, or that it is endowed with an intelligence commensurate with the functions it performs in organic life. Philosophers may differ in their views as to its origin, or its ultimate destiny, 
or its psychological significance outside of the functions it performs in keeping the machinery of life in motion, but no one denies its existence, its intelligence, or its power over the functions, sensations, and conditions of the body. It will be seen, therefore, that I am not citing any facts that are new to science. I am merely giving a slightly new interpretation to the old and universally admitted facts of science when I point out the obvious truth that this central intelligence, operating upon the myriad intelligence of which the physical organism is composed, constitutes the mechanism, so to speak, by which the mind controls the body in health and disease. I have ventured to designate this central intelligence as the subjective mind, and I have shown, in Part 1, of this book, that it is constantly amenable to control by the power of suggestion, thus pointing out a means by which the machinery of mental healing may be set in motion, either by the patient himself or by others. In doing so, however, I have merely reiterated, with the greater emphasis and elaboration that are justified by added years of experience and observation, what I had previously laid down in the Law of Psychic Phenomena. In that work, I was the first to formulate a working hypothesis applicable alike to all methods, for the systematic study and practice of mental healing. And I am proud to say that since then many successful schools of suggestive therapeutics have been founded whose faculties acknowledge that formula to be the expression of the fundamental law of mental medicine. And I hasten to remark that, in what I shall have to say here and after, nothing of that formula will be taken back or modified, but much will be said in explanation of phenomena that have hitherto, in the opinion of many, refuse to range themselves under the law of suggestion. I allude especially to the phenomena of so-called animal magnetism, or, as it has been designated in honor of its supposed discoverer, mesmerism. This includes all those seemingly miraculous cures which, in both ancient and modern times, have been affected by personal contact or digital manipulation, otherwise, the laying on of hands slash it is a matter of history that in all the ages of mankind marvelous cures have been affected by the laying on of hands. But no attempt was ever made to account for the phenomena on anything like scientific grounds until Mesmer essayed an explanation on the hypothesis of fluidic emanations from the healer impinging upon the patient and carrying with them a fresh stock of health and vitality. The logical absurdity of explaining the unknown by something still more unknown seems never to have occurred to either Mesmer or his followers, and they made the all too common mistake of taking it for granted that when once a name was given to a phenomenon, all further explanations were superfluous and impertinent. And so it happened that Mesmer's followers held, and still hold, with hysterical insistence, that the term animal magnetism affords a complete scientific explanation of the phenomena of healing by laying on of hands, passes, or other forms of digital manipulation. If asked what animal magnetism is, they reply that it is a fluidic emanation from the healer, and if pressed for an explanation as to what the fluid is, their reply is that it is animal magnetism. And there you are, forever in the vicious circle. In the meantime, the scientific opponents of Mesmer have been equally loud and insistent and hysterical in their opposition to the fluidic theory, even when constrained to admit the phenomena, which most of them denied for many years. But none of them has ever yet offered a valid reason for denying either the phenomena or the fluid. It is a popular belief among them that Braid utterly disproved the fluidic theory by his peculiar methods of inducing hypnosis. But Braid never claimed that he had done more than to prove that some of the phenomena of mesmerism could be produced without the personal contact of the operator with his subject, zero in the other hand. He acknowledged his inability to produce the higher phenomena of mesmerism by his processes and contented himself with casting aspersions upon the genuineness of such phenomena as he could not reproduce or understand. I refer particularly to the phenomena of telepathy or thought transference which were at that time being constantly produced by the methods of mesmerism or animal magnetism, that is, by personal contact. In later times, the opponents of the fluidic theory derived much comfort from the discovery of the law of suggestion. Following the lead of the Nancy School of Hypnotism, they ascribed every effect to the suggestions necessarily embraced in making mesmeric passes when they were made for avowedly therapeutic purposes. And in all candor, it must be admitted that such passes when made with avowed curative intent, constitute a very powerful suggestion, and one which might succeed independently of any other factor in the case. 
But when it is known that young children too young to understand the import of any form of suggestion, and even animals, according to the authority of the early mesmerists, have been cured by mesmeric or magnetic manipulation, it will be seen that there is something in their processes that cannot be accounted for on the theory of suggestion, as that term is at present understood. In point of fact, it must be admitted that the fluidic theory was vastly strengthened by the fact mentioned, and if there was no other way to account for the facts, I should be slow to dogmatize against the fluidic theory. Absurd as it appears in statement, and in the absence of other than negative evidence to support it. It seems to me, however, that we have not far to look for a valid working hypothesis when we stop to consider what is known to science of the character of the mechanism through which the subjective mind operates to control the functions of the body. Let us, then, make a brief provisional examination of that mechanism, reserving our proofs of each proposition for subsequent chapters. We may start with a universal postulate, which requires no proofs, and which will not be disputed, namely, 1. The force or energy which controls the bodily functions from within is a mental energy. This proposition, obviously true as it is, seems to have been overlooked by those who deny the power of mind over the body in health and disease. It embraces, in fact, the very gist and essence of mental medicine, for the initial impulse which stimulates and controls the functions of each and every cell of the body is necessarily a mental impulse proceeding from a central intelligence. Two. This central intelligence necessarily operates, through appropriate mechanism, upon the subordinate intelligences. 3. The subordinate intelligences are the cells of which the whole body is composed, each of which is an intelligent entity, endowed with powers commensurate with its functions. 4. The means of communicating intelligence both to and from the central, controlling mental organism are the nerves, which are composed of highly differentiated cells whose intelligence, like that of every other group of cells, is especially adapted to the functions which they perform. 5. The nerves of each organ of the body have peripheral termini, one in the back near the spinal column, and the other in front, approximately, near the location of the organ. 6. The nerve terminals in the cuticle are composed of still more highly differentiated cells which are especially adapted to the performance of two functions, namely, experiencing the sensations of pain or of pleasure, and especially those in the tips of the fingers of communicating with, or taking cognizance of, things extraneous to the bodily organism, sense of touch. These are the most highly differentiated cells in the whole periphery of the body. Thus far the crassest materialism will not venture a denial of my propositions, for they embrace the facts which science has discovered and promulgated in standard works, without reference to their bearing upon the question which we are now discussing. Nor will any scientist deny that the central intelligence which controls the bodily functions, by whatever name it may be designated, is amply provided with facilities for exercising its powers. That is to say, it is in possession of the mechanism through which it can convey to every cell in the body the necessary mental stimulus to regulate its functions. Nor will any educated physician doubt or deny the proposition that this central intelligence is susceptible of control by the power of suggestion. But that question is apart from my present purpose, having been already discussed at some length. What I now wish to inquire is, what light does the examination of the bodily mechanism throw upon the question of so-called magnetic or mesmeric cures, or what may be generically known as curing by the laying on of hands, the oldest, the most generally practiced, and with all the most effective of all the ancient systems of mental medicine? Is it a fluid emanation from the healer, fluid health? fluid vitality, segregated from a reservoir of fluid health existing in the healer and impinging upon and flowing into the patient? Or is it a mental therapeutic impulse conveyed from the subjective mind of the healer to the affected cells of the patient, by means of cellular rapport established by personal contact, through the mechanism which we have been describing? I have no hesitation in declaring my firm conviction that the latter is the true explanation of all the marvelous phenomena which, in all the ages, have followed the laying on of hands for therapeutic purposes. Considered merely as a working hypothesis, it embraces all the essentials of validity, for it accounts for all the facts, which is more than can be said of any fluidic or magnetic theory, from that of Mesmer down to the vague speculations of the humblest of his followers. Moreover, it does not seek to explain the unknown by reference to a hypothetical something still more unknown. On the contrary, it correlates the known facts of physiological science which are pertinent to the question, 
with the known psychological facts bearing upon the case, as I shall attempt to show more clearly when I come to discuss the subject in greater detail. In the meantime, I hasten to say that the acceptance of this hypothesis does not necessitate a revision of the fundamental law of mental medicine as stated in the first part of this book. It merely reveals the existence and potency of a hitherto unknown or misunderstood form of suggestion. I have ventured to designate it as histionic suggestion, for the obvious reason that it is conveyed through the cellular tissues of both healer and patient. It is, of course, a mental impulse, rapport being established by digital contact, otherwise the laying on of hands, the peripheral cells of the two thus impinging and forming a continuous chain through which a mental therapeutic impulse can be conveyed. The intelligent reader will at once correlate this with the well-known facts of thought transference by means of personal contact, which is sometimes called muscle reading, to distinguish it from telepathy, which is mind reading at a distance. It will thus be seen that the same physiological mechanism that is employed by the subjective mind to convey a mental therapeutic impulse to a diseased organ from within may be employed by another subjective mind from without for the same purpose. The mechanism is there. The telegraphic line is open. Its terminals are available because they extend to the periphery, and pain proclaims, in unmistakable language, the point where the outside connection is to be made. It is as simple and obvious as the connecting of two telegraphic instruments by joining their wires. The instruments, being identical in construction, vibrate in harmony the moment the connection is established, and intelligence may be conveyed from one to the other. The essential condition is that the wires must be joined. And so it is with the human instrumentalities. They are identical in structure in all essential particulars. Each individual is possessed of the mechanism for communicating intelligence. And the condition essential to communication with each other is that their wares shall be connected. The wires of the human instruments are the nerves. The connection is made by bringing the nerve terminals into contact, and this is done by the laying on of hands. To realize that this is unqualifiedly true, it is only necessary to recall the well-known fact that personal contact renders experimental thought transference comparatively easy. The Society for Psychical Research has demonstrated this fact over and over again. Moreover, the therapeutic value of this method can be appreciated only when it is known that it is vastly easier to convey a therapeutic impulse by means of personal contact than it is to transfer a thought or message. For the latter can be made available only after it has been elevated above the threshold of normal consciousness. It requires a good deal of psychic power to enable one to convey a telepathic message to another in such a way as to be understood, even with the aid of personal contact whereas almost anyone can, with that aid, convey an effective therapeutic impulse or histionic suggestion. The reason is that a telepathic message that conveys specific information to another must be translated, so to speak, into terms of objective experience, whereas a therapeutic impulse or histionic suggestion is expressed in the language of the soul, and it requires no translation to enable another soul to understand it. Hence it is that young children are susceptible to its influence to a very remarkable degree. Every sympathetic mother instinctively employs it to soothe the pains of her ailing infant, ignorantly, it is true, but often with marvelous therapeutic potency. Everyone recalls, with reverent gratitude, the soothing influence of the mother's sympathetic touch when pain and anguish wring the brow. It follows that if this method of healing can be reduced to a science, so that it can be intelligently applied to old and young alike, by anyone possessed of common intelligence, the best of nature's remedies will stand revealed. It is my purpose in the ensuing chapters of this book to suggest a line of study and practice which, it is hoped, may result in discoveries that will invest so-called magnetism with its true scientific value. It may be recalled, by those familiar with my first work slash that I expressed a doubt of the correctness of the magnetic or fluidic theory, but expressed a preference for its methods when employed as a therapeutic agent. I was not then so well prepared with reasons for my belief as I am now, having since devoted nearly a decade, practically, to the study of the subject. The result is a practical confirmation of the views then outlined. The variations, if any are to be found, are in the details and are the result of the correlation of the facts of physiology with those of psychology. I shall at least be able to show that the magnetic or fluidic theory is unnecessary and it is an axiom of science that an unnecessary hypothesis is necessarily wrong. 
if I succeed in this, another desirable result will have been accomplished, namely, the correlation of all the facts of mental therapeutics, showing that they all range themselves under the one supreme law of mental medicine, duality, and suggestion. Hitherto the adherents of the magnetic hypothesis have held that their system constituted an exception to the rule that suggestion is the prime factor in the production of therapeutic results. If this were true, it would show that neither hypothesis was correct, for nature's laws admit of no exceptions. One exception disproves a hypothesis with just as much scientific certainty as a thousand. Again, if my hypothesis is correct, it must necessarily lead to a better understanding of the practical methods of rendering the knowledge thus gained available for the uses of mankind. A knowledge of the structure of a machine is always necessary to enable an engineer to run it, and to keep it in repair and in continuous operation, with the least expenditure of time and energy. Without that knowledge one may succeed for a time in running a machine, but when it gets out of order he is at a loss to know the cause and in his attempts to repair it he generally does more damage than good, to say nothing of his waste of time and misdirected energy. The world is full of illustrative examples of this kind of engineering and the practice of mental therapeutics. Without the slightest knowledge of the fundamental principles of mental medicine, healers sometimes succeed in hitting the right spot in the machine to set it in motion. Just as a small boy might accidentally open the throttle of a locomotive engine and set it in motion, the result in either case, good or bad, depending, not upon knowledge of the machine, but certainly upon circumstances beyond their control. To a certain extent magnetic healers are also handicapped, not by that crass and dismal ignorance which is the inseparable concomitant of superstition, but by their strenuous adherence to a hypothesis that is often misleading, and hence necessarily unsound. Nor is it because their methods of mechanical manipulation are entirely wrong, but because it is often misdirected, thus entailing upon themselves a vast amount of labor that is useless to the patient. Nevertheless, they are often successful in effecting cures that are little short of the miraculous, and this is presumptive evidence that their failures are due to misdirected applications of methods that are in themselves substantially correct. It is my purpose to point out a system of practice by means of which greater certainty of results may be attained with less labor on the part of the healer. Based upon the undisputed psychophysiological facts of science, the practice will be found to be simple to the last degree, and it may be successfully employed in the family by anyone of ordinary intelligence. For nature has supplied the means for an inerrant diagnosis, and physiological science has long ago unwittingly revealed the exact locations where the stimuli are to be applied. I say unwittingly, for the sciences of anatomy, physiology, and histology have been developed independently of medical theories or therapeutical hypotheses. Scientists have simply told us what the scalpel and the microscope reveal as to our physical structure and left therapeutists to draw their own conclusions. It follows that no system of therapeutics can be complete when the great body of knowledge thus gained is ignored. I refer more particularly to those systems which depend upon material remedies, i.e., drugs and medicines, or upon digital manipulation or laying on of hands, otherwise, magnetic treatment, so called purely mental healing or suggestive therapeutics, stands upon a somewhat different footing, for reasons that need not be here discussed. I desire to say, however, in this connection, that what is to follow in this book must not be construed as militating in the slightest degree against what has been said of the law of suggestion, or the potency of suggestion as a therapeutic agency. Suggestion PLA 3S its subtle role, for good or ill, in all systems of healing. It is a constant force or energy, which, like gravity, may be directed, but not evaded, utilized, but not with impunity ignored. There is, however, necessarily a vast difference in the therapeutic value of the different forms of suggestion, the effectiveness of each depending upon the mental condition which it induces in the patient. Hence it is that a form of suggestion that is effective in one case will utterly fail in another. It follows that the skill of the practitioner consists largely in his ability to adapt his suggestions to the exigencies of each particular case, that is, to the mental status of each patient. Hence it is that in many cases under present practice hypnotism is resorted to in order to enable the operator to command the necessary mental conditions by shutting out all adverse objective influences or auto-suggestions. I shall have no difficulty in showing that histionic suggestion combines all that is valuable in all other forms of suggestion, and, moreover, 
that it renders hypnotism unnecessary in any case. Not that the element of faith can be dispensed within this process, but that it can be inspired with a certainty of results unattainable by any other process, and in defiance of adverse auto-suggestions or any other adverse influence whatsoever. The intelligent student of mental medicine will at once recognize this as the great desideratum in psychotherapeutics. For all systems heretofore devised have been handicapped by the ever-present difficulty of securing the necessary mental conditions in the patient. In a word, I shall attempt to show that the oldest, most effective, and, among primitive peoples, the most universally practiced system of mental healing that history mentions can be reduced to a science and practiced intelligently. For it is founded upon a law of nature that is as universal and as beneficent as the love of God for his children.